Welcome to A Word from the Lord, everyone. Good to see you this evening. Uh, had a little confusion there. Uh, James over here with you, and glad you're with us tonight. Here's how you can reach us if you'd like to contact me, A Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276 340 2653. And we'd be glad to hear from you tonight. Uh, tonight, our lesson is going to be discussing how certain are you about your salvation. You know, when you're talking to individuals about what they know, uh, oftentimes, if you ask a few questions, they really aren't very certain about uh, their salvation or the church they're in or anything really pertaining to the Bible. And so tonight, we're going to be dealing with that, uh, that very subject. Because, friends, when we're talking about our salvation, we ought to know for sure the things that we believe. Now, oftentimes, when we talk to uh, people, they, they think that we are somewhat cocky or arrogant or whatever because we are so certain about what we believe. But I want you to notice what Luke says in Luke chapter 1. Now Luke is writing to uh, uh, a brother, Theopolis is, is what his name is, and notice what he says. He says, For as much as many have taken in hand to write, uh, set for, uh, taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Now think about that. Most surely believed among us. The things that we believe are very, very certain in our minds. We, are, we have the extreme confidence in the things that we believe. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, <clears throat> it seemed good to me, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theopolis. Now, Luke is dealing with some things that individuals have come along and they have uh, said some things that were true. And he says, well, they don't really know what they're talking about. He said, I have perfect knowledge of the things that uh, have happened from the beginning. And so I'm going to set them in order. I know for sure <clears throat> about what happened. Now, stay with me, friends. If, <clears throat> if you want to know some information... Uh, about an event that took place, wouldn't you want to know from someone who was there? I mean, we talk about finding out well what happened at, at the uh, uh, you know at the at the at the at the mall, or what happened at the at the at the concert, or what happened at the um, uh, store, or what happened at school. Well, if a big event took place, you'd probably want to know from someone who was there. Not this. I heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from another. You know, we want to know the things that happened. Well, what better thing to do than talk to someone who was there? Well, Luke says, I was there. I know I have a certainty from the beginning of the things that were uh, set in order. He says, I'm going to set in order the things because I have perfect understanding of all things. Now, I said Luke was there from the beginning. He might have been there from the very beginning, but he was certainly inspired and had those things. And he was traveling a lot with Paul, so he knew a great deal firsthand about what was going on. And so then he says, this is why I'm going to tell you that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Friends, we want you to have certainty about the things that you've been taught. And the only way to do that is really to open up the Bible and see if they agree with what the Bible says, the things you, that you've been taught. See if they agree with the things that, that God says. And chances are, if you're listening to me and you're not a member of the Lord's church, I know that if you're honest, you're going to find some things that are not in line with God's Word. Now, I want to question you, and I simply want to ask you this question. How is it you can be certain that you're going to go to heaven? How is it you can be certain that you are right with God? How is it you're certain that your sins are forgiven? How is it you're certain that what you practice and what you believe is acceptable to God if it's not in line with the Word of God. See, we want you to have some certainty about things. We want you to be uh, dead sure about these things. Now, there is, there, there's, there's much that's not certainly known from the Bible. I mean, no doubt about that. When you talk to people, they're talking about uh, <clears throat> angels. We were coming down here, I was talking to... Uh, Blake, and we're talking about the people, what people believe, and he said, well, in our country, you know, 
we're, we're number one in the number of people that believe in angels. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm glad we believe in angels, but here's the thing. How many people, you know, that includes all the kooks out there that think they've seen angels or talked to angels or felt angels and been guided by angels and so forth. And so how many people are certain that what they believe uh, is based upon the Bible? Because a lot of times what individuals will say is they'll say, well, I've just been taught it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right. I'm, I'm certain about it. my mama said it. My daddy said it. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty because it's not from the Bible. But people are pretty certain even in their uncertainty. Friends, if you're, if you're in uncertainty, I want you to be certain of one thing. I want you to be certain that you are lost. I want you to be certain that you don't know what the Bible says. But when we're done, I want you to be certain. And I want you to be confident because I want you to say, you know what, I'm getting it right from the book. I know this is right. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 14, listen to what Paul says. Paul tells Timothy, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I want you to continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of. Now, friends, there's a lot of individuals that might be assuring you Oh, yeah, this is right. This is right in keeping with the Bible. But, friends, just because you've been assured of doesn't mean that you can be certain it's in the Bible. You need to be assured by basing what you believe on the fact that you can find it in God's Word. Now, just coming in here and telling the Caleb's lesson, you know, talking about all the Baptist manuals and the things that the Baptists are teaching, and there's a lot of people that are certain that what they've been taught and what they've been, uh, you know, uh, educated in is from the Bible. But the bottom line is, if you've been taught Baptist doctrine, you are only certain that it's Baptist doctrine. You can't be certain that it's gospel. Friends, I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm just trying to make you think. You know, what you're certain of, are you certain that it's from the Bible? If you're so sure fire about it, are you sure it's in the Bible? Now, here's a question we're going to be answering tonight. What must I do to be saved. Now, can you know for certain? I pick up a little track from time to time, <clears throat> and it's usually put up by Baptist or some other denomination or some other denomination. And it says, you know, if you were to die tonight, where would you wind up? Would you go to heaven if you were to die right now? Are you certain about where you where you'd be? And as a matter of fact, there's one of our uh, one of our brethren was uh, uh, passing out pamphlets or passing out tracks in a, a truck stop, and a member of the Lord's church came by, and uh, this, this man was going to ask, or was asking uh, the member of the church if, if he was saved. And the member of the church knew that what the pamphlet said was not in keeping with the Bible. And he kind of turned the tables on him. And he said, you know what? Uh, if I die tonight, no one's going to go to heaven. And he showed him in the Bible where no one has gone to heaven. No one has entered in heaven. Now, this man was certain that he had the truth and he was going to teach someone the truth. But the bottom line was he wasn't certain about it. When he started seeing it from the Bible, he started saying, you know what, I'm not real certain of it. And I had Bible studies with this man and uh, he obeyed the gospel and baptized him down in the Hall River down in Burlington. Now, why? Because what he was certain of, really, he wasn't certain of it in the Bible. Now, friends, can you know for certain that what you've done to obey, to obey the Lord is going to, free, is going to save you? Can you be certain that what you believe is going to save you in the end? Listen, there are three places in the Bible that, someone, that people ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Three places in the Bible, and three times that question is answered. But now, I want you to notice it's answered differently every time. Now, you might be saying, well, James, that seems like it's pretty uncertain about what a person must do to be saved then. If it's answered three different ways, how can you be certain that you're, what you're telling me is the right way? Well, friends, I can be certain of it because I can show you that every time these questions are answered in the Bible, even though they're given a different answer, I can still be certain that they're all right. I can be certain that Three different answers to the same question is going to be exactly right. I'm confident of it, and we're going to show you that tonight. 
The first place in, in Acts 2, verse 37, on the day of Pentecost, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? What, must, what shall we do to be saved? In Acts 9, verse 6, Saul of Tarsus asked, What will thou have me to do? Asking Jesus, what will you have me to do? And in Acts 16, verse 30, the Philippian jailer said, What must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So, three different questions and three different answers, and we're going to be certain that they're all correct. That all three individuals were told the right thing to do. And they were all told the same thing to do in one sense. So I'm certain of this, that what we're going to show you tonight is going to help you have some certainty to know whether or not you have done what you need to do to be saved. Now, let's consider the question, what must I do to be saved? First of all, notice what. We're talking about something here. Something is required in order to obtain salvation. So the question that we're asking is, what is it? What is that one thing or what is the thing that is required in order to obtain salvation? What are the things or things that is needed? And then the question says, what must? Now, friends, when you hear the word must, that means that is something that is a necessity. It's an imperative. It is a requirement. You can't do without it. And so if something is a must, if something is a must, that means it cannot be left out. For example, look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, is it the case that belief or faith is a must? Well, no doubt about it. It is, a, it is a necessity. It is a must. It is impossible to please God without it. Now, if something can't be done without something, then that one thing has to be added. It has to be included. Otherwise, you don't get the desired result. If something is a must, you have to include it. You have to include it. Now, notice this. In John 3, John 3 and verse 7, <clears throat> Nicodemus, let's back up verse uh, 5. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and, of, and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto ye, Ye must be born again. Now, that being born again, that is a necessity, that is a must. And so if something is said, uh, or if you ask the question, what must I do to be saved? That means there are something, whatever is given, cannot be left out. All right? What must I do? Now, friends, when you ask that question, we're not talking about what your family is going to do. We're not talking about what your mom and your daddy do. You know, this is not a collective effort here. What you need to realize is it's personal. It is just up to you. What must I do to be saved? Now, in Acts, uh, Acts 2 verse 37, <clears throat> Acts 2 and verse 37, on the day of Pentecost, there was a whole lot of people there. And they said, when they heard this, they were preaching their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Why? Because they were all asking the same question. But the response was, to every one of you. Okay? The response was to every one of you. Everybody had to do it for themselves. Now, you can't get all your friends together and go, well, I'm going to be saved. We're all going to be saved, and y'all going to do all the work, and I'm going to tag along. It didn't work that way. <clears throat> that might work that way if you're going out to eat pizza, and you're going to tag along and let somebody else buy your pizza, and you're going to get some. All right, well, you got some pizza. But this is not a collective thing. This is an individual thing. What must I do to be saved? Now, what must I do? Now, friends, we're trying to reason with you here. You need to be certain that if something is told, or if you're told to do something, you have to take some action. Now, I know we live in a society, and a whole lot of individuals out here in the, in the religious world tell you you don't have to do anything. They'll tell you, well, you don't do anything for your salvation. You don't have any part of that's work salvation. You don't do anything. 
But I find it interesting that when you're talking about what the Bible says, and you're trying to find out with certainty what must, uh, what is required for salvation, the three times that the question is asked, it always requires the word do. What must we do? What must I do? That means that there's action, a work, or some kind of effort to be put forth on the person's part who's going to be saved or who wants to be saved. In Hebrews 13, verse 21, Hebrews 13, 21, look at this. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The idea is if you have faith, you're going to be doing something. If you realize or if you believe, if you are certain that there is something amiss in your life that stands between you and being in a right relationship with God, you're going to do something. You're going to want to do something. What must I do to be saved? That is to obtain salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sins, have my sins blotted out, remitted, removed, taken away, forgotten of God. What must I do to be saved? That's what we're talking about. When someone says to be saved, that is what they're implying, that they are now have their sins removed and they're in a right relationship with God. So the question we're talking about is, what must I do to be saved? Now those three questions that, we, that we're going to show you tonight are, to, are designed to give you some certainty about your salvation, whether you have done what the Bible says or not. Now I submit to you, friends, that most of you out here watching have not done what the Bible says to do. You may be pretty confident that what you have done has led to your salvation, but I submit to you that when we look at it, you really haven't done it. Now let's look. Let's have some certainty here. Because the only way we're going to know surely, certainly, and have confidence that what we believed of is doing what the Bible says. The Bible gives the instructions and a man must follow them. We must follow the instructions. But how do you know what to do? How do you know for certain what to do? Well, let's just listen to the Bible. And whatever the Bible says do, whatever answers we find in the Bible, to this question, what must I do to be saved, is what we must do in order to know for sure, for certain, that we have obtained salvation that is offered by God. Let's, go, let's start with Acts 16, verse 30. In Acts 16, verse 30, let's just look at the context here. Acts 16, verse 30. <clears throat> The context is, the context is Paul is in Philippi and he's praying. He and Silas are in jail. They've been in prison. They're praying and singing praises unto God. And about midnight there was an earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open. He drew out a sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now listen, he asked the question, What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, let's look at this. Here's a Gentile. Paul tells him, or he is told, to believe on Jesus. Now, as a Gentile, has he heard anything about Jesus? Does he know anything about Jesus? Now, he might have heard something about Jesus when they were singing praises in the prison. But for all practical purposes, he doesn't know anything about Jesus. So he needed to know something about Jesus in order to believe on Jesus. How was he supposed to believe that Jesus was the Savior of the world? How is he supposed to believe that? Listen, in, in Romans chapter in Romans chapter 10, right? In Romans chapter uh, 9, 10 verse 9, Paul said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
Now, if he hasn't heard anything about Jesus, he certainly hasn't heard that Jesus has been raised from the dead. So how is he have, going to have any kind of faith or belief in Christ if he's never even heard of the man? See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And so in order for this man to be saved, the first thing he's got to do is believe. Remember we just read uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. So he needs some faith in order <clears throat> to start pleasing God. And so the way you get faith, the way you get faith is you hear the word of God. If faith comes by hearing, you hear by the word of God. Look what the, what the ne very next verse says. In Acts 16, verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Why? Because he needed to believe in order to have his sins forgiven, in order to be saved. Belief was essential. It was required. Now, the reason why he's told to believe is because he doesn't know anything about it. Now, if that was all he needed to do to be saved, because we're told today, and a lot of people say with certainty, it's just faith only. I mean, we've played, I don't know how many times we've played these preachers or these people have called in and said, well, it's just faith only. John 3, 16, period. He that believeth is all you need. You know, God so loved the world that gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's all you need. We're told by these preachers and people in the know who are supposed to be very certain about their faith. Jerry Carter over here at Reedsville Baptist Church said there's 50 or 60 verses that talk about saved by faith only. Uh, A.C. Smith comes on. He's, he's sitting down having a debate with Johnny Robertson. He says what? Thousands of verses that talk about saved by faith only. There's not a thousand. There's not 60. There's not... 60,000, there's not a thousand and sixty. There's not one sixtieth of a thousandth of verses that say, saved by faith only. Now, if this jailer was told to believe only, someone surely would find that and say, well, here's certainty that saved by faith only is what I need to do. But you know what? You can't find faith only in Acts 16. You just told a man that's told to believe. Now, if he was saved, if he was saved by, by faith only or belief only, then he would be saved before repenting. Wouldn't he? See, friends, if he's saved by faith only, he's saved before he ever repented. If he believes and that's it, then he's saved before repenting. And Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Acts 13, Luke 13, 3. In Acts 70, verse 30, Paul said that God commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, if anyone today is so certain that you're saved by faith only, please tell me how you're saved without, without even repenting. Now, I've had people call and tell me, well, belief and repentance are all one and the same. Friends, if they were all one and the same, you wouldn't need words like repent and, and belief. You wouldn't need two different words. But these are two different things, belief and repentance. And if the man is saved by belief only, not only is he saved before repenting, he's saved before confessing Christ. In John 12, verse 42... John 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of synagogue. Were these people saved at the point of belief? They believed, but yet they didn't confess. See, friends, if you're certain that you're saved by faith only, you won't find it in the Bible. Your certainty must be based upon something other than the Word of God. Now, friends, I want my faith, I want to be assured because I know I can find it in the Bible. I would not want to stand before God and be so dogmatic and so certain that He's going to let me in based upon something that I cannot find in the Bible. You see, believing on Jesus for this uh, uh, Philippian jailer 
is not the only condition of salvation, but it was the first thing that this man needed. And so he was told, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If you don't believe the first rattle out of the box, it doesn't matter if there's a thousand things to do after belief. If you don't believe, you'll never do it. So the first thing this man needed was belief, and that's why he was told, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But it doesn't mean that was the only thing he did. It doesn't mean that it was the only thing he did. It was just the thing that necessitated or facilitated the rest of the things that he was told he needed to do. Later on, we're going to find that he was baptized. Later on, we were, we're going to find, notice this in Acts 16, in verse 32. Sorry about that. Acts 16. Notice, they taught him the word of the Lord. They spake to him the word of the Lord. And he took them the same hour and washed their stripes. There's penitence, repentance. And was baptized, he and all his house, straightway. Now, what must he do to be saved? Well, he's told believe. But that wasn't the only thing he needed. That's just the first thing he needed. Now, let's look at the next question. Let's look at the next question. In... Uh, Acts 2 and verse 37. On the day of Pentecost, all these devout Jews gathered from all nations under heaven are listening to Peter and the other 11 preach the first gospel sermon. And they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. Now, notice this. They weren't told to believe. Why did Peter not tell them to believe? Why did Peter not tell them, Well, the first thing you need to believe is Jesus. And that he's the son of God and that he was raised from the dead. You know why they, he didn't tell them to believe? He had already convinced them and they already had belief. That is what prompted them to ask, what must we do to be saved? Because the thing they just heard, they had just heard that Jesus, whom they had crucified, God had raised him from the dead and made him both Lord and Christ. Notice this in Acts 2 verse 36. Back up a verse. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified both Lord and Christ. When the sermon was finished or when the sermon was, was coming to a major point here and they had heard that they had killed the Messiah the one that David said would come and reign on his throne. The one that God had promised would sit on the throne of David. The one that God had promised would come and save his people from their sins. When they realized you, that they had killed the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, they were pricked in their hearts and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, it's obvious they already believed. Now they're convinced that this man that they crucified was the Son of God, so now they're asking, what must we do? And they were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Now friends, there's a lot of people that are certain that these two things don't have anything to do with each other. There's a lot of people that are convinced that repent and be baptized are not connected. But notice this, if repent is forward or in order to obtain remission of sins for the remission of sins then it is a must and it is connected with baptism repent and be baptized so if repent is essential to salvation if it is one of those things what must we do if they must repent then be baptized is also a must-do in order to 
have your sins remitted. You can't separate those two. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, I don't know why that's so hard. So many people have certainty that, that well, you have to believe, and yeah, you've got to repent, and then you're saved, and then baptism comes along after that. That's not what the Bible says. Acts 2, Acts 2 and verse 38 they were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. If repent is for and is a must, then so is baptism a for and must. Now, I want you to notice this, friends. I want you, I want you to have certainty about what I'm saying. In Acts 2.38, the reason why I'm certain that Acts 2.38 means in order to obtain remission of sins. The reason why I'm certain that repentance and baptism come before a person's sins are forgiven is because that same phrase is used in another place. I know it does not mean because of remission of sins. Now there's a lot of Preachers out there that will tell you, well, that just means repent and then be baptized because your sins are forgiven. Somewhere in between repent, uh, somewhere between these words right here, somewhere between repent and this, salvation takes place according to some people. Now, I don't see it in there. I'm not certain of that fact because I don't see it. What I do see is I see repent connected with be baptized by a thing called and. Now, if you don't know what and is, maybe you just need to listen to Schoolhouse Rock, you know, a little conjunction junction. What's your function? Well, hook it up right here. Repent and be baptized. They go together. And it's for the remission of sins. Now, here's why I'm certain that it's for the remission of sins. In Matthew 26... In Matthew 26 and verse 28, here's that same phrase again, for the remission of sins. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, if for the remission of sins means because your sins are forgiven in Acts 2.38, then for the remission of sins must mean Jesus died and shed his blood because sins were already forgiven. But friends, no one in their right mind is going to say that you can be forgiven of your sins before the blood was shed. You and I cannot have our sins forgiven without the blood of Christ. Even people under the first covenant, even people in the Old Testament who were looking forward to Christ's coming, did not have their sins forgiven until Christ died on the cross. Look at this, Hebrews chapter uh, 9 and verse 15. For this cause he's the mediator of a new, covenant, new testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Look at this. That by means of death, for the redemption of of the transgressions under the first testament for the redemption the remission of sins redemption of transgressions remission of sins under the first testament why did Christ shed his blood? for the remission of sins why were they told to repent and be baptized? for the remission of sins friends you just can't separate it you just can't separate it. Now, what must I do to be saved? These folks were told something a little bit different than what the, uh, the Philippian jailer were told. Why? They're starting at different places. The jailer needed to believe. These folks already believed. They had just heard a sermon. The, 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 the jailer hadn't heard a sermon yet. These folks had already heard the sermon. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They'd already heard the word. They were preaching their hearts. They believed. Now what must we do to be saved? What must we do to be saved? 
And so they were told to repent and be baptized. Now, is that a different answer? No. Not really, it's not. It's only a different answer because they were in a different place. But they all had to believe. Both the jailer and these Jews had to believe. And they both had to repent. And they both had to be, all had to be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. Now, this is why we're saying, friends, it's important. It's important that you have some certainty. You might be seeing these things and say, well, there's some, there's some contradiction there. No, no contradiction. No contradiction. These folks had, had already heard and believed. The jailer hadn't. Here's another question. Or here's another uh, question or time when this question is asked. What must I do to be saved? Now, this question comes from Saul of Tarsus. Saul is on his way to Damascus to find some Christians that he can bind and bring to prison and uh, bring to Jerusalem, put them in prison, or even kill them. And the Bible says in verse 3, Acts 9, verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? To do. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Must do. Now, as Paul makes his way to where he's supposed to believe, uh, supposed to hear this, hear what to do. Notice, we've already seen that he believes. And when Ananias gets there, notice this. When Ananias gets there, Saul arose. His eyes were opened, but he saw no man. They led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him he said, said the Lord of vision, Behold, I'm, and he said, Behold, I'm here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his side. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many of this man. How much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem, where he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for it is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children <coughs> of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for thy name's sake. Now, when Ananias gets there, he finds Saul. He's been, he's been praying for three days. And immediately, and so he lays his hands on him, and immediately there fell from his eyes that it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now, as Paul is telling this on another occasion, he gives a little more details here. Ananias comes in and says, why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Now, here's what we have. When Ananias found Saul, Paul, when Ananias found Saul of Tarsus, <clears throat> he didn't tell him to believe, like the jailer. He didn't tell him to repent, like the Jews on Pentecost. He was simply said, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized? Now, why is it that, that Saul was told this and the other two groups were told something different? Here's why. It's obvious that he believed. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It is impossible to please God without faith. Faith was essential, and we know that Saul of Tarsus had it, Otherwise, 
He wouldn't have done what he said. He wouldn't have done what he was told to do. He wouldn't have even asked what must I do if he didn't believe. And so we know he had faith because when he heard that, what, that the person who spoke to him was Jesus Christ, he said, Lord, what will thou have me do? He acknowledged that Jesus was the Son of God. He believed that Christ was raised from the dead. Finally, he believed it. <clears throat> so there's belief. He's penitent. Notice, he's been praying for three days without food or water. That's, that's, that's a penitent. That is a broken and contrite heart which is what the Lord loves, is what the psalmist said, Psalm 34. That's what the Lord loves. And here he's praying. There's no doubt about it, he's penitent. There's no doubt about it that he is sorry. He believes that Jesus is the Lord. He's confessed that Jesus is the Lord. He's repenting, penitent, broken down, contrite. The only thing left for him to do is to be baptized and wash away his sins. Now friends, the reason why I'm so certain of that, the reason why I'm so certain of that is because it agrees with everything that you read in the Bible and other places about what is essential to salvation. Now, are you certain about your salvation? Are you certain that what you have done is in keeping with the Bible? Listen, Jesus told him that he would be told what he must do. And the only thing Ananias told Saul of Tarsus was arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The only thing he was told to do was be baptized. Now, now let me tell you something, friends. If you were to ask Jesus today, if you were in Saul of Tarsus' shoes and you said, Lord, what must I do? And Jesus said, I'm going to send you to Damascus and someone's going to tell you what you must do. And the only thing that person tells you when they get there is be baptized and wash away your sins. Are you going to fight with it? Are you going to argue against it? Are you going to just, you know, bow up and go, I ain't going to do it. I don't believe in the work salvation. Is that really what you're going to do? The only thing that Saul of Tarsus was told that he must do at this point was to be baptized. Therefore, to be baptized and wash away your sins is something that we must do. Now, why does someone want to argue with that? Why does someone want to argue that? We hear people all the time, they call, they, they call in or they talk to us on the streets, whatever, and they say, well, I don't believe you've got to be baptized. Preachers are telling it all the time. Oh, you don't got to be baptized. You, you need to be baptized to, to, to obey the Lord and be pleasing to Him, but, but you don't have to be baptized to be saved. That's a lie. You're putting your certainty in something that's not in the Bible. Now, friends, Saul of Tarsus was pretty certain that baptism was essential to his salvation. You know why? He didn't eat or drink for three days, waiting to hear the words, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? He was waiting to hear those words because those were the words that he must do in order to be saved. That's what he's waiting on. And after he heard those words and he did those things and had been obedient to what the Lord said he must do, I know he was in a whole lot better mood. You know why? Acts 9 says he took meat. He started eating. Now, if he was still broken and contrite and if he was still sorrowful and still was not convinced that God had forgiven his sins, I think he'd still be fasting and praying, don't you? This was a devout Jew. Saul of Tarsus was a devout man. If he wasn't convinced that being baptized took care of his sins and, and uh, made him in a right relationship with God, I can assure you he'd still be praying and fasting until he was convinced that he was right with God. Yet he was told, 
Be baptized. That's something you must do. Now, friends, all these three groups that we saw, all these three groups that we looked at, there are some things we can be certain about. We can be certain that it was essential that they believed. It was certain, we are, can be certain that it was essential that they repented of their sins. It, we can be certain that it was essential that they confess Jesus Christ, Son of God, and we can be certain that they had to be baptized for the rent of sins. I'll tell you something else I'm certain of. I'm certain that none of these groups were told to do anything that people today are told to do, and yet the people of today are more certain about things that are not in the Bible than the things that are in the Bible. Now think about that. If someone asked a question today, if these people asked a question today, what must I do to be saved? You know what they'd hear today? They'd hear things like, well, you can't do anything until the Holy Spirit operates on you. See, you've got to let the Holy Spirit illuminate you and guide you and, 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 and make you understand the Word. Otherwise, you, you can't be saved until the Holy Spirit operates on you. Which I find it very interesting because then there's another group of people you know, there's another group of people that say, well, the Holy Spirit don't operate on you. The Holy Spirit don't come, it doesn't, uh, doesn't reside in anybody who's not saved. Well, which is it? You got to have the Holy Spirit to save you. But if you have the Holy Spirit to save you, then you must have already been saved because the Holy Spirit saved you. Boy, that's a, that's a wrap your mind around that. The Holy Spirit comes and operates on people and helps them understand the word that they need to hear in order to be saved. But the fact that the Holy Spirit operates on them is an indication that they're already saved. See how silly that is? That, the only thing I'm certain about is that don't make any kind of sense. But yet we hear people today say, oh, yeah, you can't understand anything about the Bible until the Holy Spirit operates on you. Well, what about the jailer? The jailer said, what must I do? And he was told, believe. And then he was told words that would produce faith. Why didn't Saul say to the jailer, well, there's nothing you can really do to be saved until the Holy Spirit operates on you. We're going to tell you some words, but if the Holy Spirit didn't operate on you and help you understand those words, well, there's nothing really you can do. Why was the jailer told the words of God if he couldn't understand them? Did he have the Holy Spirit? The Bible doesn't say he did. As a matter of fact, we don't know the, uh, the, that the Philippian jailer got uh, any kind of miraculous gifts. All we know was he'd been obedient to the gospel. All we know is he did what God said do. See, people today, they're told this. I don't hear that in the Bible. All I heard was believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. You know what people today are told? They're told, well, Israel is God's chosen people. And I hear that from so-called Christians. You don't need to believe in Jesus. You know? Well, listen, if, God, if Israel is God's chosen people today, then I, you need to be a Jew, not a Christian. Today, if, if Israel is so great in, in the eyes of God, if that nation over there and the little, uh, little chunk of land they have over there in Palestine, if that is so special, if those people are so special to God, we need to become Jews, not Christians. But you know what? Even Jews weren't told this. The Jews on the, the, Jews on the day of Pentecost, they weren't told, well, you see, you are God's chosen people, and so, uh, you know, we don't need to be doing anything because... I mean, you're the real deal. They weren't told that. Instead, they were told, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Instead, they were told, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And Nicodemus that we uh, talked about earlier, he was a Jew. He was a leader in Israel. And yet he was told, you must be born again. Why didn't someone like John, why didn't Paul just do like John Hagee or, or Peter 
on the day of Pentecost, just tell like John Hagee. Israel is God's chosen people. We need to love our brother Jew. No, friends, the Jewish people need to repent and be baptized, every one of them, just like all these Gentiles need to repent and be baptized, every one of them. There's no special people in God's eyes today other than those individuals who are obedient to God. But no one ever said anything about how special Israel was back then. So why are they saying about today? Or what about this? Well, just follow your conscience. Just do what you think is right. Friends, you realize people today are told things like this? No one in the Bible said it said, was told anything like this. And yet people today have confidence. Well, I, I just do what I think is right, what I feel is right. In Acts 23, in Acts 23, Paul said, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, what Paul had done in his good conscience was this. He said, I, exercise, uh, I, I do exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. But yet what he had done in that good conscience was persecute Christians and kill them. Vo- give a voice to put them to death. That's what he'd done with a good conscience. Friends, no one was told, just do what you think right. But that's what we're told today. Are you really certain... You're going to base your soul salvation and be certain about it based upon something that you can't even find in the Bible, the sinner's prayer. Not in the Bible. Here's Saul of Tarsus, Paul. He was a sinner, no doubt about it. He'd been praying for three days and his sins were not removed. If they were forgiven, he was the most miserable new Christian I'd ever met or ever read about in my life. Listen, when... When people obey the gospel and they obey it because they know it's what God says do and they must do it in order to be pleasing to God, when people obey the gospel today, like the Bible says, you know what? It is a joyful, joyful, joyful occasion. They're not beating down, crying and moaning and praying and and fasting for three days. No. They may be praying, but it's thanksgiving to God, not, not a penitent. Uh, prayer. It's a rejoicing and thanksgiving because God has forgiven their sins. No one in the Bible was told, say the sinner's prayer. It's just not in there. Yet people today, they say it with such certainty. I don't know where they get their certainty. Have an experience. Listen, if anybody had an experience to tell it, it was Saul of Tarsus. But you know what? He didn't tell Ananias what he had done. He didn't say, oh, Ananias, let me tell you the story. Let me, let me, let me tell you. Let me tell you. The Lord spoke to me. Oh, Ananias, the Lord spoke to me. You know what Ananias would have said? Shut up, man. I know all about it. The Lord already told me the whole story. You need to be baptized. And you know what, friends? I don't want to hear your stories about what God did for you, how you think God moved you and the angel touched you or whatever. Your experiences are not what's important. If Saul of Tarsus didn't tell his experience in order to be saved, you and I don't have one uh, tale to tell. We don't have anything to compare to that. Why should you tell your experience? Now, none of those things are in the Bible. Why do you have certainty? Why would you have certainty that what you have done to be saved is going to save you if you've done any of those things? See what I conclude? What must we do to be saved? are none of the things that you're hearing today, but what you must do to be saved are the things that are in the Bible. See, all three of these different people that we talked about, the people on the day of Pentecost, the Philippian jailer, and in Saul of Tarsus, all three required doing the same things, but they were all at different points on the road to salvation. And that's why the, the Philippian jetter was told, you, first of all, you need, to, you need to believe. And then we'll tell you the rest of what you need to do. But first of all, we've got to convince you that Jesus is the Son of God. People on the day of Pentecost, they'd already believed. They'd already been convinced of it. They need to repent and be baptized. Saul of Tarsus, he already believed. He was already penitent. He'd already confessed Christ. All he needed to do is arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. 
Now, friends, I'm certain. <clears throat> I'm certain that all these people were told the same thing. I'm certain all these people did the same thing. You know why? Because it's in the Bible. And here's how you can be certain. You can be certain, too, that if you want your sins forgiven, that God would, would forgive your sins and wash them away, what you need to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hear the gospel and believe it, Acts 15, verse 7. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, verse 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 36 and 37, like the eunuch did. Here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then be baptized in order for your sins to be forgiven. Why tarest thou arise and be baptized? These are all things, friends, that are required of you. And if this was what was required of them, then surely it's what's required of us now. Friends, I'm certain of it. And you can be certain too. And if you're certain that you're a member of a man-made church, I'm certain of this, friends, you're lost. But I'm certain of this, if you do these things, you can become a member of the Lord's church, the church of Christ. And I'm certain of this, if you need help, all you have to do is call me, get in touch with me, I'll come and help you. I'll assist you. I'll study the Bible with you to give you the certainty you need to do what the Lord says to do to be saved. Friends, we're out of time. Thanks for watching. Until next time, always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.